Well, hello there, and welcome to Ryan Rambles You to Rest, the sleep podcast where I talk at length about matters of nearly no urgent need, nor heavy impact on our daily lives, in the interest of helping you there, off to a more peaceful state. In this episode, we will take a break from doing the roundup of Vegetables I Know. We did enough last time that I feel like we can take a hiatus. We will, however, continue on our epic how-to journey through the voluminous Kobo Clara HD e-reader by Rakuten User Guide, which we are reading on a Kobo Clara HD e-reader by Rakuten. We will also be trying a new, really random topic approach, where what I'm going to do instead of hitting a random topic generator is click the random article button on Wikipedia, and we'll see what we get there. I had a look around at this before, and it seems some articles are pretty short, some are pretty long, and we'll find out what we get. It should be totally uninteresting. Before we get started, I have some updates for listeners for this and previous episodes. First, a further word about cucumbers. In our last episode, I continued the roundup of vegetables I know by including cucumbers. But after the time of the recording, there were a couple of things which occurred to me that I think are worth adding to a post-facto note here in the updates. First, it was brought to my memory by one of our listeners that cucumbers are an essential part of the refreshing Pimm's Cup cocktail. If you haven't had one on a hot summer day, especially in high humidity, then you owe it to yourself. The second thing I want to address is that I said before that I don't much care for pickles on a sandwich, with a cheeseburger being the exception. But I forgot to mention that pickles are a welcomed and essential part of a great Cuban sandwich. Also in our last episode, we ended the roundup of Vegetables I Know segment with the eggplant, which left me, and perhaps yourself, wondering where the name eggplant comes from. Because I cannot access the internet during the roundup, I promised I would investigate this mystery between episodes. The origins of the name of this plant, this eggplant, are fairly enlightening. But before we dive into the details, it is incumbent upon myself, my duty, to recognize and report to the also ignorant among you that, like the bell pepper, the eggplant is not a vegetable, but in fact, a fruit. Believe me, I am just as disappointed as you are. I share your instinctive sense of betrayal. My mind also recoils from this revelation. Before a room of adults, if you described, for the soft mind of a child, eggplant parmesan as a dish full of fruit, breaded and baked, served in a fruit sauce and topped with cheese, you would understandably be asked not to speak again to the child. But you would be correct. Alas, here we are, and must move on from this together. I apologize if this has made you understandably too angry to rest. However, we may derive some mild contentment in knowing that this sort of unwelcomed realization lends some anticipation to our journey through the roundup of fruits I know in some future episode. Let us now turn back to the origins of the name for this alleged fruit, the egg plant. I have located on the internet a few short explanations of uncitationed informational origin and cannot verify their validity but will nevertheless share what I have found with you here. The description that I have chosen 
is from worldwidewords.org. This curious comestible, actually a fruit, but eaten as a vegetable, probably has more names in varieties of the English language than any other. Eaten as a vegetable, but actually a fruit. I'm not really quite sure I know what that means. I mean, I kind of get it. You don't just take a bite out of a eggplant. Anyway, moving on. That's because it has been cultivated for a very long time and has been widely transmitted across the world from its heartland in eastern and southern Asia. The Arabs introduced it to Spain from India as early as the 8th century AD, and the Persians took it to Africa. The name of eggplant was given it by Europeans in the middle of the 18th century because the variety they knew had fruits that were the shape and size of goose eggs. That variety also had fruits that are a whitish or yellowish color rather than the wine purple that is more familiar to us nowadays. So the sort they knew really did look as though it had fruits like eggs. I think that's pretty interesting. There's a bit more to go over here, but probably the most revelatory piece of information, besides this nonsense about being a fruit, is that the fruit that Europeans knew originally was the color of eggs. It seems bizarre. Moving on. In Britain, it is usually called an aubergine, a name which was borrowed through French and Catalan from its Arabic name al-badinjan. al badinjan al badinjan bad badinjan al badinjan okay that word had reached arabic through persian from the sanskrit vatimgana which indicates how long it has been cultivated in india in india it has in the past been called brinjal a word which comes from the same arabic source as british aubergine but filtered through Portuguese. The current term among English speakers in India is either the Hindi bangin or aubergine. Some people in the southern states of the U.S. still know it as guinea squash, a name that commemorates it having been brought there from West Africa in the 18th century. And I presume not because it resembles a guinea pig. Although, thinking about it, they do share some shapely similarities. Of these names, eggplant is the easiest to say and remember. But its prosaic descriptiveness lacks the romance and sense of history that is attached to the others. Well, isn't this fascinating? There are apparently a great many names for eggplant from its spread around what seems like the entire world. On another page I found called A Thousand Names for Eggplant, which turned out to be a gross exaggeration, by the way, there is a kind of flow chart that shows how the eggplant traveled and the evolution of its names with 18 examples. Its early Latin name is Solanum insanum, which means it is part of the broader genus Solanum, which includes potatoes, and tomatoes. Hopefully this does not mean that potatoes have also been a fruit all this time. I'm not even going to find out right now. Anyway, insanum in Latin means exceedingly, enormously, or immensely. The English word insane does come from it. What tickled me personally and the reason I am sharing this, is that according to the flowchart, the original English term for eggplant was mad apple. That's pretty weird. 
This may have also been due to the relationship to the nightshade family of plants, and one other source suggests that it took some time for folks to even try eggplant because they thought it was poisonous. Pretty interesting stuff, huh? Well, I hope these additional learnings have pacified your own deep resentment toward the aubergine status as a fruit, as they have for me. Finally, my memory is a sieve these days, and I could probably make a podcast entirely based on misrememberings which transpired in the episode immediately prior. But I did want to make sure to correct myself about the eggplant skewer, which was served a million years ago at a Japanese restaurant by my house. The dish was called nasu cheese yakitori and consisted of eggplant, basil, and Swiss cheese, which I misremembered as mozzarella in the previous episode. I think very understandably given the other ingredients. In a way, it did play as a mini eggplant parmesan, and it was very good. In the past, for our really random topic, we have used CapitalizeMyTitle.com's Random Topic Generator. It is definitely a good source for a topic that starts a conversation. It tends towards setting up a dialogue as an icebreaker. And even though our relationship right now is mainly one way, we can probably both agree that it has served us well to date. However, I thought it might be pleasant to change things up this time and visit our friends at Wikipedia which has a random article button that we'll be using here. Just as with our normal approach, I have not prepared for these articles in advance. And although I plan mainly to read from them without as much exposition, this is still an on-the-fly segment. From a little testing, I found that a great many articles are very brief, so we may learn about more than just one topic. Before we get started, a quick shout out to Wikipedia, a tremendous platform and resource for information that relies on all of our contributions to keep the lights on and continue providing a bottomless collection of articles. Now then, here I am at wikipedia.com and will now click the random article button. Here we go with our first random article. Karen Coke. We got a Karen. Oh, excuse me. Right off the bat, it tells me that her name is pronounced Cook. And she was born in 1951 and is still alive. Karen Cook is an American former ice hockey goaltender. She played for the Marquette Iron Rangers in the United States Hockey League during the 1969-1970 season. She signed a contract for $40 per game, which made her the first professional female hockey player in North America. As of 2000, as far as her coach Leonard Oki Brum knew, she was the first in the world. Well, this is exciting. We've got the first professional female hockey player. Personal life. By the way, there is a single photograph here of her in pads. Uh, it's black and white and looks like it could be maybe from a newspaper. Um, it's got that kind of graininess to it. Um, and she's got huge hockey pads on. Okay, personal life. Since her hockey days, she has earned a bachelor's and a master's degree, both in English literature from Wayne State University and the University of Dayton, respectively. She holds a black belt in judo and a brown belt in jiu-jitsu. Karen loves birds and all creatures of the wild. And apparently there are... Uh, citations for this uh, to back it up. It looks like it might be the bio that was taken from marketironrangers.com 
archived at the Wayback Machine. So likely the site isn't even there anymore. But isn't that very interesting? A bachelor's degree and a master's degree, and a black belt in judo and a brown belt in jiu-jitsu. Very fascinating. And now here's the meat of the entry, her hockey career. The USHL welcomed her as the first female professional hockey player when she was only 18. At the time, the Iron Rangers were the defending champs. Leonard Oki Brum, then coach for the past 18 seasons, has said her only drawback was her size and that, since they were larger, the team's other goalies, quote, stopped more pucks by accident than she did on purpose, end quote. Her addition to the team brought complaints from the other players, despite their admittance that she was good. It also brought national publicity as the team got calls from the Associated Press, United Press International, Reuters, and newspapers, radio and TV stations from all over the U.S. and Canada. And when it came time to cut the team down to 18 players and two goalies, the coach adjusted the numbers so that he could keep her on the team. Her presence caused such a stir that the Salt State Marie Ontario officials insisted that she be announced as the starting goaltender to swell attendance. They also set up a pre-game penalty shot with then-Mayor John Rhodes, who has been a hockey player in the past. Karen received a standing ovation when she stopped Rhodes's shot. She was eventually let go from the Iron Rangers after repeatedly going against her coach's orders and removing her mask during the after Christmas games. There were 10 games left in the schedule at the time. She went on to play in the Toronto area and made national headlines again when she was barred by the Canadian Amateur Hockey Association from playing on men's teams. Boy, howdy. For all of the, uh, well, it looks like for all of the admiration that Canadians get from America, they still had some of the same problems we do today in the United States. That said, this has been a very interesting article. That's the end of it, by the way. That's all we can learn about Karen Cook for now on Wikipedia. But wasn't it interesting? the first professional female hockey player in North America. Okay now, let's keep going. Another random article. Our next article is another biography. This one is Joanna P. Moore. And there is a photo here of her as a uh, elderly woman with uh, sort of a classic uh, 19th century look. Joanna Patterson Moore, September 26, 1832 to April 15, 1916. Yeah death and taxes, am I right? Was an American Baptist missionary. She was the first woman missionary appointed by the American Baptist Home Mission Society and worked predominantly among black communities in the American South. She founded a series of training schools and helped organize women's activities. She also founded the monthly magazine, Hope, promoting biblical literacy. Born in Clarion County, Pennsylvania, she went to Island No. 10 in the Mississippi River in November 1863 to work with 
around 1,000 black women and children who had gone there seeking protection by the Union Army during the Civil War. She later ministered in Helena, Arkansas, Lauderdale, Mississippi, and New Orleans. In 1902, she published her autobiography, In Christ's Stead. She died in Selma, Alabama. Well, this is interesting. That's pretty much all there is. But we have a, another biography and another first. The first woman missionary appointed to the American Baptist Home Mission Society. And she died in Selma, Alabama. I've been to Selma on a trip of the civil rights movement through the South. It was a very interesting place to visit. Selma is, of course, famous for very important marches during the civil rights movement in the United States, and is famous for uh, Bloody Sunday, and of course the march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, which the trip that we were on, we walked across it just to have the experience. It's one of the poorer parts of Alabama, but it has its charm as well. If I remember correctly, it was one of the few interesting hotels that we stayed at on the trip because we had been staying in sort of regular motels and hotels that are, you know, don't have a lot of character, so to speak. But the hotel in Selma, I remember being a kind of almost antique building with lots of old furniture and nifty carpeting and rooms and so on and so forth. That whole trip itself was actually very interesting. It was a trip for high school students, and myself and my compatriots from our production company at the time had been hired on to film the experience as a documentary about this program that would put kids on a bus and drive them from Georgia, uh, Atlanta, to Arkansas and let them see Little Rock and then culminate in Memphis at the Lorraine Motel where Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. I was there again just recently, maybe a month ago, and went to the Civil Rights Museum there at the Lorraine Motel. And I have to say, I can't recommend it enough. It is a absolutely fabulous experience. It's a very linear exhibit. You sort of begin at the beginning with slavery, and then it carries you through most of the way to the modern day with little beats along the way from the civil rights movement. And everything is just super elaborately designed. There are all kinds of infographics and colorful representations and little tableaus and... It's actually quite overwhelming and hugely impressive. And we were mostly able to take our time, but we ran right up to when the museum was closing and really had to, like, book it past the Dr. King's room, which is pretty much at the very end of the full experience. And then, of course, there's an exit through the gift shop where I was able to acquire a new refrigerator magnet which is a reprint of an advert in the newspaper from the time that the Lorraine Motel was in operation. Today it's obviously not a hotel anymore. And it really is quite interesting architecturally because the facade of the original motel is still there, or 
something that resembles the facade of the original motel, and then the museum is built behind it and inside of it. It's really, really spectacular, and probably one of the most interesting museums I've ever been inside of. All right then, let's move on to our next article. Okay, this article is about Kemble family. Kemble is the name of a family of English actors who reigned over the English stage for many decades. The most famous were Sarah Siddons, from 1755 to 1831, and her brother, John Philip Kemble, 1757 to 1823. The two eldest of the twelve children of Roger Kemble, a strolling player and manager of the Warwickshire Company of Comedians, who, in 1753, married an actress, Sarah Ward. Roger Kemble was born in Hereford and was a grandnephew of Father John Kemble, Dr. John Kemble, a recusant Catholic priest who was hanged in that city in 1679. Three younger children of Roger, Stephen Kemble, Charles Kemble, and Elizabeth Whitlock were also actors, while Anne Hatton was a novelist. Now then, this article has a bit more detail. There's actually a table of contents, but strangely there's not very much here. There is the popular culture section, and a bit about the extended family. So let's begin with popular culture of the Kemble family, a family of English actors from the mostly 18th, 19th, and 18th centuries. In George Henry Harlow's famous painting, the court for the trial of Queen Catherine, he depicted many of the Kemble family members. And this painting is included here on the Wikipedia page uh, to look at. And it's a full-color painting, and I honestly don't have an art degree, so it's difficult for me to describe, but in terms of the, you know, aesthetic it definitely looks like a depiction of the court for the trial of Queen Catherine, as performed by the famous Kemble family of English actors. The subject of the painting comes from Henry VIII, Act II, Scene Four, and the refutation of Cardinal Wolsey, charged with obtaining Henry's divorce from his queen, Catherine. I'm honestly not very familiar with Henry VIII. I mean, I, I know the famous song about Henry VIII, but the play itself I don't have any connection to. The production was mounted by John Philip Kemble when he took over the management of Covent Garden in 1806. Harlow was a personal friend of the Kemble family, and this picture is homage to his friends. John Philip Kemble, clothed in scarlet, plays Wolsey, and is indeed, to my eye, the most colorful part of the frame, or second, perhaps. The, the most attention-grabbing is someone wearing a blue tunic in the sort of center middle frame, whose back is to the painting. But the cardinal is in bright red and definitely is the next most colorful part of the painting. His brother, Charles Kemble, in black, has the part of Thomas Cromwell, and sits behind the table. I barely noticed, but that's Charlie Kemble for you. Immediately behind and above him is Stephen Kemble as Henry. The sister, Sarah Siddons, is Catherine. Well, you'll have to take my word for it, but it's the sort of painting that you'd more likely see in a museum than on someone's home wall. 
Now on to extended family. The tradition was continued by two daughters of Charles Kemble and Maria Theresa Kemble. Actress and Shakespearean reader Fanny Kemble, 1800 to 1893, and Adelaide Kemble, 1815 to 1879, an opera singer. Both Sarah Siddons' son, Henry Kemble, and Stephen Kemble's son, also named Henry Kemble, became actors. Among later members of the Kemble family, mention may also be made by Charles Kemble's grandson, Henry Kemble, 1848 to 1907, so just about the same time as Joanna P. Moore, our previous article, a sterling and popular London actor. At least two 20th century members were Violet Kemble Cooper and Lillian Kemble Cooper, descending from the Kemble Croft 1930-2020 line, is 21st century actor Sebastian Croft, a popular 21st century actor. Well, I don't personally know this popular Sebastian Croft myself, but perhaps one of you out there knows Sebastian Croft and could enlighten me as to what makes Sebastian Croft a popular 21st century actor. There is here in the citations, a link to Sebastian Croft's IMDb page. So perhaps in our updates next week, we can learn a little bit more about the descendants of the famous Kemble family of English actors. Otherwise, I haven't got very much to say about English actors. Or otherwise, I suppose I could talk a little bit about English actors. There have been quite a few great English actors, and I think all of us know that. One of my personal favorites was Peter O'Toole. Peter O'Toole, to me, could pretty much do no wrong. He always brought quite a bit of gusto and passion to his performances, and you'd be hard-pressed to find a single Peter O'Toole performance that wasn't pretty spectacular. Of course, too, there are just innumerable other great English actors who are, you know, from my background, film actors. And another thing that I like about English actors, and honestly, many actors from different countries other than the United States, is how so many of them have become famous for playing in American movies with American accents and Honestly, most of the time you don't know until you see them in an interview that they're from another country. An example that comes to mind almost immediately is the movie Black Hawk Down, which was directed by Ridley Scott, and most of the actors in that movie were not from the United States. Most of the main characters weren't even American actors. And today, a lot of those actors are pretty famous. But in particular, I remember that the two actors who played the American snipers who were killed trying to rescue a pilot weren't even native English speakers. And one of the two of them went on to become very famous as Jamie Lannister in Game of Thrones. And sticking on the HBO train of thought, another one of my favorites is Idris Elba, who I was introduced to through The Wire, where he was absolutely fantastic. And to find out later, too, that he was not an American, not only not from Baltimore, but not even American, was also pretty shocking. Not disappointing or shocking in the way that it turns out that eggplant is a fruit, but more impressive than anything else. I also think it's interesting how often there are families that share a profession together, 
and in particular actors, because with movie and TV performers, they're almost necessarily also celebrities. So you tend to see these cases where entire families become showbiz people. I can't think of too many off the top of my head, and if I had to do a roundup of show business families I know, it would probably not take very long. I can think of the Sheen Estevez family most immediately off the top of my head, and maybe the Douglases. Do the Hankses count? I guess they do, right? Hanks, Tom Hanks and Colin Hanks. Perhaps this is a topic we can explore in greater detail in another episode. Or perhaps for the update next time, I can fill you in on a few of the top well-known families of actors. Let's move on to another article. Here we have an entry that is not even an article, really. It's just uh, more of a reference. Basically, it's just a couple of words with what they stand for or what they mean. And and I'll, I'll fill you in here. So, it is Aeolus Expressaria. Aeolus Expressaria. And it is a moth in the family of Geometridae. Geometridae. It is found in Honduras. Its kingdom is Animalia. Its phylum is Anthropoda. Its class is Insecta. Its order is Lepidoptera. Its family is Geometridae, as I said. And its genus, of course, is Aeolus. Aeolus expressaria. It looks as though it was perhaps discovered or named, I'm not sure which, in 1861 by someone named Walker, perhaps? It's not very clear information. Well, I don't know a lot about moths, but I have been to Honduras. And it was a very beautiful country, although, quite frankly, I only saw the northwesternmost tip of Honduras. It was a big birthday trip for my partner, and we started in Guatemala, then went to Honduras, then back through Guatemala, and eventually ended up in Belize. But Honduras was very nice. We stayed in Copan Ruinas, which was close to a complex of of pyramids that we were able to just sort of walk to and check out. And the town itself was on a hill. It's very hilly. And the the top of the hill was where the town square was. And it was a pretty nice park there. And, you know, on one side there was a bank and, uh, you know, there were some restaurants and bars and so on. And the town had a, a number of stray dogs, and there was one dog in particular that uh, had a bit of a bum leg that became a friend of ours during our stay there, and we called that dog Buddy, and Buddy followed us around most of the time. Buddy didn't come out to the ruins, I don't think, but uh, he followed us around town pretty much the rest of the time, and the ruins were definitely impressive, and Another exciting part of that trip was from Copan Ruinas, we went to a coffee plantation, Finca El Cisne, where we stayed there overnight one night and uh, got a tour of the plantation on horseback. And it was it was personally my first time uh, riding horseback, and the, actually the only time that I've ridden horseback that I can think of. Definitely the only time that I rode solo horseback. Uh, and it was very exciting and probably dangerous. But, um, you know, the, the sort of thing that you 
probably couldn't get away with doing in the United States. We went all over this plantation, down hills, through the water, and sometimes we could race the horses around, which to me was a little terrifying. And I, I had sort of a beginner's horse anyway, named Luna. And uh, she was just a super nice horse. One of my favorite things about that experience was that there were two fellows that showed us around the plantation. And throughout the tour, we would just stop by sometimes seemingly random trees, and they would just pull fruit down out of the trees. And we had all sorts of just fresh-picked fruits that I had never had before. That particular experience was definitely one to you know, bake into my mind that when you travel abroad, it's important to try different foods and different things because of how regimented our access to food is. Even here in California, we have a lot of great produce, but most of the time, 90% of what you find at even a farmer's market are the most common fruits and vegetables and produce that you're familiar with. But when you travel abroad, sometimes you come across all kinds of things that don't grow here or we don't grow here on purpose or for some other reason, and you really have to take that opportunity to try out different foods that simply don't exist in dishes or at restaurants or in markets where you're from. With all that said, I highly recommend checking out Honduras, or at least Copan Ruinas in Honduras. It was a nice sort of village. We had the dog friend named Buddy. And I remember it was a thing that um, there wasn't always functioning electricity. Like there were blackouts that would sometimes happen in town. And... I remember one night walking home from dinner, we walked past a video game parlor, and I of course had to uh, duck my head in there because I have a gaming background, and uh, there were kids in there uh, sitting in front of Xboxes that were, some of them were playing FIFA, and uh, a couple were playing Left 4 Dead, which is a very popular game among me and my friends. And it was super cool to see them all hanging out and playing video games in this parlor. But then, hours later, there was a, a blackout, and it was the first thing that I thought of, was the, like, ten kids that just had their games go out. And I thought, oh man, that's too bad. I felt it. In any case... Highly recommend Copan Ruinas in Honduras. Now then, I'm enjoying this, so I think we should do at least one more random article and see if we get something longer than a description of a moth. Okay, here we go. Well, this one isn't very long either, but it is another sports entry and another person. I wonder if most of Wikipedia isn't entries about individual people or animals or chemistry formulas. Here we have Ken Holcomb. Ken Holcomb. Ken Edward Holcomb, born August 23rd, 1918, and died March 15th, the Ides, 2010. Mark Edward Holcomb was an American Major League Baseball pitcher with the New York Yankees, Cincinnati Reds, Chicago White Sox, St. Louis Browns, and Boston Red Sox between 1945 and 1953. Holcomb batted and threw right-handed. He was born in Burnsville, North Carolina. 
and uh, spoiler alert, he dies in Weaverville, North Carolina, at the age of 91. Okay, let's get into his career. Holcomb entered the majors in 1945 with the New York Yankees, playing for them one year before joining the Cincinnati Reds, then the Chicago White Sox in 1950, then the St. Louis Browns in 1952, and the Boston Red Sox in 1953. One might infer from how much he moved around that he was either not the best player or not the easiest to get along with. In his rookie season, he showed promise as a solid reliever for the Yankees, going 3-3 three and three with a 1.79 ERA in 55 and a third innings in 23 appearances. Uh, but he developed a chronic bursitis that eventually ended his career. His most productive season came for the 1951 White Sox, when he won 11 games as a starter, including a 3.78 ERA and 12 complete games, all career highs. In 12 games for the 1952 Browns, Holcomb was 0-2 with a 3.80 ERA. He wrapped up his major league time by going 2-1 for the 1953 Red Sox. In a six-season career, Holcomb posted an 18-32 record with a 3.98 ERA in 99 appearances, including 48 starts, 18 complete games, 2 shutouts, 32 games finished, 2 saves, and 375 even innings of work. This is Ken Holcomb. Now, I'm definitely not an expert on baseball, and my friends know this about me. So, I don't know whether the win-loss record of 18 and 32 is necessarily something you would normally pin on the pitcher. But if that's the case, maybe you can let me know. Because as an outsider, that doesn't seem very good. He also had 118 strikeouts, another thing where I don't know if that's very good for a six-season long career. Given that Ken Holcomb lived to the ripe old age of 91 when he passed away in March of 2010, it's a little bit unfortunate that all we have here in Wikipedia is about the six-season career that he had playing baseball, because one would have to imagine that in 91 years there's a bit more that went on. Did he have a family? Were any of his kids famous actors like the Kembles? I wonder if that information is out there. It's definitely not here on Wikipedia. The photo that we have here as well looks like it might be from a baseball card, but it's an illustration. There's no photograph. And uh, the illustration is a pitcher who is in that pose of having recently thrown the pitch with his baseball cap on and in his uniform. Okay, while I'm somewhat disinclined to tempt fate. I do want to read one more article, and hopefully we don't land on another one that's too long, but I would also not like to land on another one that's too short. So let's see if we get lucky. Okay, this one is also not very long, and we'll find out how informative. This article is called Summer Desire. 
Midsummer Desire is the name of the first and only nighttime special aired under the Another World soap opera banner. Touted as special event programming, the hour-long episode aired just before the Daytime Emmy Awards on June 23, 1992. Hmm. I think when I was a kid, I watched Another World for a little while. I had a brief period where I watched some of the soap operas on TV just because I was curious about them. And this was probably a fascination that took place over a summer or two when I was a kid. And I think Another World was one of the ones I watched. But I I can't remember for certain. And there's a chance that I was watching it around 1992. That would be before, let's see, that would be right when I was moving out to California. So I think, I think my, I think my soap opera period might have predated moving to California uh, from Pennsylvania, June 23rd, 1992. That would have to be right around when I was moving out. So... That was right around the time that my father took me on a road trip where we drove from Philadelphia to San Francisco with all of my junk packed into the car. I don't have a ton of very specific memories of the trip, but I I do remember the Badlands and I remember wall drug with the jackalopes. And of course, it's hard to forget, even so long ago as it was, going to Yellowstone National Park. I remember we slept in the car one night, and if I remember correctly, there was a moose wandering around the campground. Pretty wild. And I remember... I think it was Iowa, just endless cornfields. It was the most boring thing I can think of in my life. Anyway, though, let's get back to Summer Desire. Unlike other soaps, which also aired one-off specials at night, the Another World special followed existing storylines in the hopes that viewers tuning in early for the daytime Emmys would be intrigued with what they saw and, by extension, would watch the show in the afternoon. The universal theme was love, and the stories followed four existing and popular couples in the series. To appeal to many demographics, 30-ish couple casts, played by Steven Schnetzer and Frankie Alice Barrett, were featured, as well as 20-somethings, Ryan and Vicky. Hmm, that's me and my partner. Paul Michael Valley and Jensen Buchanan. And Jake and Paulina, played by Tom Eplin and Judy Evans Luciano. Teen super couple Dean and Jenna, played by Ricky Paul Golden and Ala Karat, received most of the story in the special episode, as a party was being thrown in honor of his new album. On the show, Dean was a budding singer, and an album was produced. One of his songs, Lady Killer, became wildly popular, and was played on the Times Square Jumbotron in the special episode. Other stories revolved around Jake and Paulina seeking out a Justice of the Peace to get married, only to end up calling it off, while Ryan and Vicky fought their attraction to one another, only to give in to their desires at the end of the episode. Well, I suppose for me that's a little bit prophetic. This special brought in low ratings, ranking 78th out of 96 programs that week with a 6.1 out of 11 rating per share, ranking a distant third in its time slot behind Full House, number 11, of course, and Home Improvement, oh, 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 on ABC, and Rescue 911, 
on CBS. Another AW nighttime special was not attempted, although its sister show, Days of Our Lives, produced more one-off episodes. Well, there you have Summer Desire, 78th out of 96, the week it aired. And in the time slot, Couldn't Beat Full House, which was a show that took place in San Francisco, and Home Improvement, which I personally remember watching quite a lot as a kid. Okay, well that was some very interesting information. Just a small jaunt through Wikipedia without purpose really gives you some idea of just how vast the database of information truly is. Do you have favorite articles on Wikipedia? Let me know. Dear listener, I hope your anticipation for the continuation of our how-to read-through of instructional epic, the Rakuten Kobo Clara HD e-reader user guide, has not kept you awake through this point in our program. But, if it has, your time has arrived. And truly, what could disengage the mind and lull us into a state of intellectual torpor with greater emotional incentive than an opus like the one we've chosen to embark on, nigh these many installments. Last time we managed to read all the way through part one about your Kobo e-reader and part two using Wi-Fi. This means we have progressed through 21 pages or 30% of the weighty 72 page owner's manual. And of course, I mean weighty metaphorically, because we are reading this Kobo Clara HD e-reader user guide on a Kobo Clara HD e-reader from Rakuten, which only weighs about 9.5 ounces with the protective cover sold separately. Of course, a variety of operational details abound in chapters and parts ahead, but first we encounter part three, Sinking Your Kobo e-reader, to which there are in itself three chapters. Understanding Sync, Sinking Your Kobo e-reader over Wi-Fi, and finally, Sinking Your Kobo e-reader with Kobo Desktop. Once again, we begin with Understanding Sync. It's important to sync regularly to download newly purchased books to your Kobo e-reader, get software or app updates, and to update your books with bookmarks or annotations you made while reading on another device. There are two ways you can sync. Using Wi-Fi or by connecting your Kobo e-reader to Kobo Desktop on your computer. I'll say just up front that the Wi-Fi works perfectly well. Like I I don't I have not encountered a particularly compelling reason to go to the trouble of hooking up your device to your computer. Unless, as I mentioned previously, that you need to download onto your device the Kobo Clara HD e-reader user guide, which is, for some reason, not available in the online store. After you've synced, you'll see the covers of all your books and previews. Some books will have the word download beside the book title or the download icon on the book cover, which is a arrow pointing down. Depending on the model of e-reader, tap the cover to download the book to your e-reader. There's really not very much to add to this, but I'll say that it doesn't take long to download any particular book. I've read a few medium to somewhat long books, and downloading them doesn't take very long. 
this is after all not like a full color uh, e-reader next section syncing your Kobo e-reader over Wi-Fi follow these instructions to read your newly purchased book from Kobo.com on your Kobo e-reader you'll need access to an active Wi-Fi connection before you start step one go to your home screen step two tap the sync icon which is the arrows in a circle at the top of the screen step three tap sync now after you sync your Kobo e-reader your book will be added to your Kobo e-readers home screen and to your my books menu to start reading just tap on the book cover this all checks out pretty much I would say that there's definitely a little bit more going on than they're letting on here in the description when you hit the sync icon usually there's like a probably a couple of minutes of it flashing through syncing articles if you keep articles on your e-reader um, which we can talk about later it's a feature I like and whether it needs to download the books or update a preview sometimes those that sort of bookkeeping no pun intended takes just a couple of minutes so it's not as simple as just here's your new book and it's on there it, it's got to go through a few checks and balances on the on the full sync process next section syncing your Kobo e-reader with Kobo desktop you can also sync your Kobo e-reader by connecting it to the, your computer with Kobo desktop your computer should be connected to the internet before you sync. To download Kobo Desktop, visit kobosetup.com. Step 1. Connect your e-reader to your computer using a micro USB cable and tap connect. 2. Open Kobo Desktop on your computer. 3. If you're not already signed in to your Kobo account, click the profile icon, which is a little profile head and shoulders in a circle, at the top of your screen and sign in. Step 4. Click the sync button, which are those circular arrows your e-reader will sync and update with the latest books here there's an illustration that shows the desktop tool window and it looks pretty standard there's uh, book covers five to be exact and there are options to uh, it looks like download add Anyway, there's several tabs and it's basically a web interface, but in the uh, top right corner there is the profile button, there is the sync button, and then there's what looks like an eject button. Maybe we'll find... Oh, here we go. Step 4. Click the eject button at the top of the screen to disconnect your e-reader from your computer and there you have it so if you don't want to do it over Wi-Fi for whatever reason you can do it by connecting to your computer and opening the Kobo desktop app which I don't think I even have downloaded similar to other apps like Slack or Discord you can also use this service by 
connecting to the website so it's not super crucial to be able to use the desktop app in this case and again why you wouldn't be syncing over Wi-Fi is still beyond me with the extra steps of having to plug into your computer and if you're like me using a Macintosh computer as your primary get things done computer then you also have to go through an adapter to even use USB so ultimately syncing through Wi-Fi is the way to go for me okay now it is time to move on to our next chapter we've gotten through the two ways of syncing your e-reader I guess I can real quick should I mention articles well we're about to do adding books so I think that I can try to remember to talk about articles a little bit after we've gone through books after all books is probably why most of us are here and if you're reading along I don't want to go too far off the beaten path here and and just as an as a as an update we are now on page 25 of 72 here in the Kobo Clara HD e-reader user guide so yes this next section is called adding books obviously this is an important thing to know how to do as you would have ostensibly purchased your e-reader whether it's a Kobo Clara HD e-reader by Rakuten some other Kobo model or even an Amazon Kindle to read books although it's possible that you purchased it primarily to read articles which this one is good for and from what I understand some of the new color e-ink e-readers that are coming out are better and better for being able to download graphic novels this particular sort of budget e-reader the Kobo Clara HD does not have color or really a sharp enough image to resolve drawings or paintings very clearly I haven't tried reading a graphic novel on it because I think that would be pointless but I have read some books that have either illustrations in some places or photographs and both illustrations and photographs whether or not they're in black and white don't resolve very well compared to just words and oddly enough the words actually do resolve very well and you can adjust your brightness which does affect the sharpness of the print resolution now then what's in this section about adding books first we'll look at buying a book on your Kobo e-reader then we'll examine browsing the bookstore the Kobo bookstore next we'll see what you would do if you wanted to add a book to your wish list and then finally we'll examine viewing your wish list buying a book on your Kobo e-reader you can buy ebooks right on your e-reader all you'll need is a Wi-Fi connection and a valid credit card once you've completed the checkout process your book will appear on the home screen step one go to your home screen step two tap shop Kobo at the bottom left of the screen step three tap the category or book you're interested in 
step four. Tap buy next to the book you want to purchase. Step five. If you've shopped with Kobo before and saved your billing information, go to step eight. I think for the sake of being thorough, we will not skip to step eight as though we have saved our billing information in the Shop Kobo store. Step six. Use the keyboard to enter your billing address and credit card information. Note, we need your billing address to calculate taxes for your order based on your location. Step seven, tap continue. Step eight. Now this is coming back in where we would have skipped ahead to if we had already put in billing information. But now that we know what to do with credit card and billing information, and in fact why we need to provide our billing address for something that is purchased electronically. So, step eight. Review your order. Presumably this means as is typical to make sure that the order is correct that what is in your basket is the correct reading material that you are interested in purchasing from shop Kobo in other words you're not leaving a review for your order of your order or for the books or about the books in your basket this in particular makes sense if the books that you are buying you have not read before. Step 9. If you want to use a gift card or promo code, tap Add Gift Card or Add Promo Code and provide the required information. Note Promo codes can only be applied to eligible ebooks since not all publishers choose to take part in promotions. Without having the site in front of us, it's safe to assume that there's a field where you just enter using the keypad you, uh, your promo code or gift card. Step number 10. Tap Confirm. Step number 11, tap Keep Shopping to buy more books, or return to the home screen. Note, if you don't see the book you purchased on the home screen, tap the sync icon, that's the circle of arrows, at the top of the screen, and then tap Sync Now. Without further description on their part, I think it's safe to assume that the sync features which we've learned about in the previous chapter would then take place. Moving on to the next part of this section. Browsing the Kobo Bookstore. The Kobo Bookstore lets you shop for books by genre, top picks, and more. You'll need access to a Wi-Fi connection before you start. Step 1. Go to your home screen. I feel like going to your home screen is always step 1. Step 2. Shop Kobo. Tap Shop Kobo at the bottom left of the screen. The Kobo bookstore page will appear. 3. Browse for your book. Use the search bar at the top of the screen to search by title or author. Tap the categories at the top of the screen to see more book genres. That's pretty straightforward 
and I don't use the Kobo bookstore a lot, but there is this integration with Overdrive for libraries, so often you can search for an author or a book, first see if it's for sale, and then immediately just change a drop down to look at Overdrive. I believe we will get to that at a later point here, but just as a footnote, that the process of finding a book through browsing the Kobo bookstore is similar to finding a book using the Kobo for your library account. Although I will add that I do almost all of my searching and checking out of library books through the library website or the OverDrive app on my phone if I'm not near my desktop. And both of those systems work great. Next section. Adding a book to your wish list. Your wish list lets you keep track of books you'd like to buy. Step 1. While shopping for a book, tap on the book cover that you're interested in. The book's detail page will appear. The book detail page shows you a book synopsis, reviews, and other related books. Step 2. Tap plus wish list beside the book cover. And now, viewing your wish list. After you've added books to your wish list, you can view the list of books you're interested in buying. Step 1. Are you one step ahead of me already? Step 1. Go. Go where? Go to your home screen. Step 2. Tap the three-line menu icon, the overflow, at the top of the screen. Step 3. Tap Wish List. You'll see a list of books that you added to your wish list. Tap the book cover to see more details about the book. With the book detail page open, tap Preview Now under the book cover to read a sample of the book. When you reach the end of the preview, you'll have an option to purchase the book. And that concludes the adding books chapter of our journey. Our next chapter covers reading your books. Now, this is not a chapter about how to read. I think we can all agree that a written chapter about how to read would be absurd on many, many levels, including raising the question why someone would purchase an e-reader, even if it were of this budget variety, like the Copo Clara HD e-reader if they themselves knew not how to read. Instead, this section will be focusing on accessing your books, which might be a little bit more of an accurate way of putting it. It's not instructing you on either how to read in practice or instructions on how to read specific books, like a manual or critical essay might tell you how to read another work. This doesn't cover any of that type of thing. This is merely focused on accessing the books that are contained within your e-reader. So as a result, I don't think that this will take us very long to get through. What's in this section? First, where to find your books. And second, searching for books. Where to find your books. Your books 
and book previews appear in the My Books menu. You can manage all the books on your e-reader from the My Books menu as well. To access your purchased books, borrowed books, and book previews, follow these steps. Step 1. Go to your home screen. Step 2. Tap the menu icon, which is the three lines, at the top of the screen. 3. Tap My Books. A list of books you own and books you've added to your e-reader will appear. I will add to this that you can also access your books just from the My Books section of the home screen itself. Like it has a panel that shows maybe the top three or so books on your list, your most recently read books, and you can click on those books directly from there. You don't have to go to an overflow menu to get there. So I think this manual is making it sound like the ebook is actually more complicated to use than it actually is. It's actually very user friendly. Although it's also possible that there have been several updates to the firmware on the Kobo Clara HD e-reader by Rakuten since this user guide was written. Searching for books. You can purchase books you'd like to buy right on your e-reader. Use the search function to find books from the Kobo bookstore by entering the book title or the author's name. Step 1. Go. Go. To your home screen. Step 2. Tap the search icon, which is the magnifying glass, at the top of the screen. Step 3. Tap the down arrow drop down icon beside Kobo and choose which you'd like to search. Select Kobo Store to search the Kobo Bookstore. You must be connected to Wi Fi. Or select My Books to search for books on your e reader. I think to add to that, you might be able to. Uh, also from that drop-down search on a connected library account. Step 4. Using the keyboard, type a book title, author name, or book series. Search results will appear as you type. Step 5. Tap a suggestion to go to that result, or tap Go to see the full list of results. In other words, if it's not as clear from reading this step by step, the search system works pretty much like every other search system we know now in this day and age where you begin typing and the top related results based on what you've typed in begin to appear automatically. Which is to say, that even if you are unfamiliar at first with your Kobo Clara HD e-reader from Rakuten, you will very likely be familiar with the functions within the device itself. We now move on to downloading from the Kobo Cloud. This is a more extensive section. And what's in it? About the Kobo Cloud. Downloading books from the Kobo Cloud to your Kobo e-reader. Downloading all your books to your Kobo e-reader at once. Removing books one at a time from your Kobo e-reader. 
removing all your books at once from your Kobo e-reader. So there are five sections ahead here. About the Kobo Cloud. And I will confess before going into this that I honestly don't know anything about the Kobo Cloud. Your book purchases from Kobo are stored in the Kobo Cloud. The Kobo Cloud is an online storage area with unlimited space. You can choose which books you want to download from the Kobo Cloud to your device. When you finish a book, you can remove it from your device to increase storage space. You can re-download a book from the Kobo Cloud anytime you have access to Wi-Fi. A magical land of unlimited space and storage for your books. A giant bookshelf, if you will, in the clouds. Downloading books from the Kobo Cloud to your Kobo Reader. If your books are stored in the Kobo Cloud, you'll need to download them to your e-reader before you can read them. Make sure your e-reader is connected to Wi-Fi to download books from the Kobo Cloud. Step 1. Go to your home screen. Step 2. Tap the Home button at the top of the screen. This is the three-line overflow menu. Step 3. Tap My Books. Any books that aren't already on your e-reader will have the word Download beside the book title or a download icon on the book cover. And that's an arrow pointing downward. Step 4. Tap the book's cover to download it. The book will start downloading. Step 5. Tap the book's cover or title to open it. If you select several books, your books will be placed in a queue and downloaded to your e-reader one at a time. In list view, the word pending will appear beside books that are in the download queue. In cover view, you'll see progress bars on the covers of books you're waiting to download. Once a book is downloaded to your device, you don't need to be connected to Wi-Fi to read it. That last bit of information really is the uh, kind of the linchpin, you might say, to the value of your Rakuten Kobo Clara HD e-reader. Once a book is downloaded to your device, you don't need to be connected to Wi-Fi to read it. I would say that it also should go without saying that you need to know how to read to read the book on your e-reader. Next section. Downloading all your books to your Kobo e-reader at once. You can download your entire collection of books onto your e-reader. This can be useful if you'll be going somewhere without access to Wi-Fi. For example, if you're about to travel, downloading all the books on your e-reader ensures that you have access to your books without connecting to Wi-Fi. In other words, if your books are downloaded onto your device, they are then on your device. I assume that means they think that is counterintuitive for some folks. And maybe it is. Maybe it just seems funny to me. But perhaps there are some people of a different generation, perhaps extremely young or extremely old, for whom the idea of downloading 
is complicated or hard to wrap their mind around. But lucky for them, there are five steps here to learn how to download all of their books at one time. Can you guess what step one is? Correct. Step one, go to your home screen. Step two, tap the three line home button at the top of the screen. Step three, tap my books. Step four, tap the three dot more icon in the gray bar. Step five, tap download all. Your books will be placed in a queue and downloaded to your e-reader one at a time. In list view, the word pending will appear beside books that are in the download queue. In cover view, you'll see progress bars on the covers of books you're waiting to download. This is much like if you were downloading from the cloud to your e-reader and not doing them all, but doing several. And I'll say this, even though I don't use the Kobo cloud, the relationship to the library when uh, renewing books or downloading books is basically the same thing as this is. Next section. Removing books one at a time from your Kobo e-reader. After you remove a book from your e-reader, you can re-download it from the Kobo cloud anytime you have access to Wi-Fi. Removing a book from your e-reader can help you save storage space. Step 1. Go to your home screen. Step 2. Tap the three-line home button at the top of the screen. Step 3. Tap My Books. Step 4. Tap and hold the cover or title of the book. A menu will appear. Step 5. Tap Remove. A dialog box will appear. Step 6. Select one of these options. Number 1. Remove download. Remove the book from your e-reader, but have the ability to re-download the item from the Kobo cloud later. You'll still see the cover of the book on your e-reader. This option is automatically selected. Option 2. Remove from my books. Delete the book from your Kobo account and all of your devices. You'll no longer see the book cover on your e-reader or Kobo apps. To put the book back onto your e-reader or Kobo app, you'll need to go to Kobo.com to restore the book from your archive. Step 7. Tap Remove. So this is something that is actually worth mentioning because when you borrow from the library, if you run out of time on a book and you didn't renew it, the book is replaced by the preview file. And so in the sim same way as this, you have to decide whether you want to delete the preview file just from your device so that it's not cluttering up your list, or if you want to remove it from your account and therefore send it to the archive. I guess if you're taking out a lot of books, it might be a little bit of a pain in the butt to go through the process of, of this kind of housekeeping, but overall it's not too big of a pain. The only thing I don't like is that with borrowing library books, I'm often left with having both the book and the preview in my books queue, 
and I haven't figured out yet if there's a way to change that. So since most of what I do is take books out of the library, I just have two versions of every book. Because I think what happens is that the book, when, when your uh, borrow period ends, is removed from your device. And the preview, I think, contains all of the additional metadata, like your bookmarks and your annotations, so that if you do take out the book again, all of that is automatically restored. But then you are therefore required to keep both around. And I don't know if there's a way to hide the preview and, and still keep all of the metadata. Perhaps we will learn more about that later in our journey. Next section. Removing all your books at once from your Kobo e-reader. You can remove all of your downloaded books from your e-reader to free up storage space. When you remove books from your e-reader, your books will still be saved in the Kobo cloud, and you can re-download them later. Step 1. Go to your home screen. Step 2. Tap the home three-line icon at the top of the screen. Step 3. Tap my books. Step 4. Tap the three-dot more icon in the gray bar. Step 5. Tap manage downloads. Step 6. Beside downloaded Kobo books, tap Remove All. Step 7. Tap Remove. All of your Kobo books will be removed from your e-reader. Well, this truly is an epic, and we will have to stop here, but surely return for the unthrilling next part of the Kobo Clara e-reader user guide in a future episode. This time we covered syncing, adding books, and reading your books, which we've determined is accessing them and um, adding and removing them. This also included the difference between getting books by buying them from the store or adding and removing books from your existing purchases. And hopefully this won't be too exciting, but next time we'll be getting into reading on your Kobo e-reader. So not just finding the books, downloading them and adding them and discovering where they are on your device, but actually how to get around reading a book, which is uh, surely an essential part of the e-reader experience. And for those who are keeping track, we are at this point on page 36. So, interestingly enough, we, after two installments, have made it exactly halfway. So perhaps this means that we will have two more installments before we are able to complete the epic journey of the Kobo Clara HD e-reader user guide. What has been your favorite part so far? Do you use an e-reader? Let me know what you think. I think we'll leave it here for this episode. I hope you have been adequately rambled to rest and are not hearing what I am saying right now. However, if for some reason you are conscious at this time, I will leave you with these parting words. Defiant. Quixotic. Fertile. Thinkable. 
average. Dirt. Bait. Gaping. Simplistic. Complain. Slow. And hug. Thank you again. I am your host, Ryan, and I'll see you next time.